Hey, Marianne Hickman here, and today's special guest is Devin Ransom. Now, I met him at one of the events I attended recently, and I really fell in love with his cause. Now, he set up several businesses and a charitable foundation based on healing, and specifically for families who aren't able to physically afford actual healing that takes place in hospitals. You will love hearing about his work and even more so about his company and the family values that he used to build it. I'm excited for you to hear it. Check it out. Yeah. Like podcast starts in the hallway. That's what I always say. Yeah. So. That's, um, so last podcast, that's what they did. The intro was actually done at the end. Yeah. And yeah. so, which makes sense. I mean, how are you going to introduce something that you don't even know what you're going to talk we about? Don't it, like, I don't know where it's going to go. They can go anywhere. I recorded a podcast this morning. So like, it, uh, how's, how have you kicked off this podcast yet that you're talking about? You started recording it? No, we have not yet. Okay. Uh -huh. So this, this is, I've started this podcast and I started another, we're starting two sub series to it. Yeah. So one is, um, do we call it tiny talks? I can't remember. Talk tips. Okay. So it's going to be like these short five to 10 minute segments yeah. about talking. And then I have this other wild, stupid, crazy, irrelevant. Oh, I want to hear about it. I oh, love it. Oh my gosh. You, you have my attention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go. I have no yeah. hopes or plans of it like taking off, but it it, it might, I don't know. I don't even You care. know it's going to take off just because- Because I sent. Yeah. So it's my friend Heather and I. Yeah. And when we get together, the stupidest stuff- I love it. Comes out of our mouth. Yeah. And the stupidest things happen. So this morning we took it down to the studio downstairs. Yeah. It's not finished. There's drywall dust on the floor. There's yeah. no mud on the walls. It, we're in folding chairs yeah. for crying out loud. And we just riff about the dumbest stuff. Like, like she went bra shopping this morning at a garage sale. And like that was like 10 minutes of the podcast. And then it but was the, like... The, these are the real things that people want to talk about that they're not talking about. Yeah. And so giving them a, an opportunity to sit in on this conversation that even these people that don't have friends and relationships like this. Yeah, yeah. Now they get to sit in on your relationship and become part of it. That's what it's I'm hoping really, will happen. Yeah. To, yeah. I, I mean, I don't even tell you anything, but, you know, just just being real and authentic and yeah. talking about crap and eating poop and, you know, it's like, you know, uh, what? that's real stuff. Like, that's I mean, a real like, stuff. That's what I love about being on stage. Right. Is that the, the storytelling part of it, of the real stuff right. that happens. And it's not always hugely traumatic. You know, like when we met um, with Jeff. Like his story, you were there, right? With Jeff Griffin? Yeah, Jeff Griffin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's where we met, I think. Um, but we've seen each other at so many events. I can't remember which was the first yeah, one. Yeah, totally. But Jeff's story is so in your face and impactful and yeah. amazing and beautiful. Yeah. And it's a story that not everyone goes through. Yeah. Not everyone's going to become a, a, a paraplegic. No. Praise God. Like, we don't want that to happen to everybody. Right. But what he's done with it yeah. is monumental. Yeah. But public speaking in general, I mean, as you know, it, it can be stories that change your life and transform others. Right. Or it can be as simple as something that happened to you in the drive through Yeah. And it's it's seemingly mediocre, but it becomes like this life lesson, you know? And that, Have you heard about Build and Bless yet? Mm -mm. So, um, Carrie... Carrie Hill, she just came on as our cultural chief cultural officer mm -hmm. for for our company, but she introduced me to uh, the Lemonade Stand, uh, and they're a marketing uh, company, and you you need to talk to with them. They're they're awesome. With Introduce their... me. I'd love to yes. have them on the show. Yes. Yeah. Their... Hey, what's up, Marianne Hickman here. Listen, I'm interrupting my own show because I want to give you something now. You guys all want to get on more stages. I've got a free resource for you of stages that are just clamoring for guests. They need guests on a daily, weekly, sometimes monthly basis. This is my podcast database. Now, what I'm going to do is have you go to MarianneHickman.com forward slash database. Once you put in your information there, I'm going to send this to you totally for free. Open up this database. You're going to click through it. Find the next podcast that's relevant to your topic hit the application button, show up on their podcast, get in front of their people and share your content. Remember, MarianneHickman.com forward slash database. Let's get you unlocked. What they're doing. And so they they started implementing a, a gifting platform. And so it's a card that they load every month and their employees are able to take that card and just do good with it. Really? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're implementing in our company now. What a cool idea. Yeah. So it's like a pay it forward card. Yeah. Not like a spiff card for you. You have to give it away. You have to give it away. No kidding. Yeah. At the end of the month, it's gone. 
And so you, you got to give that away. And so you can actually, they have a whole platform and everything. So even with, even with people that are on your team, if you want to recognize them, you yeah. can, you can even recognize them using the card. There's, diff- there's cool. so many different uses, but it's build and bless. And, um, and I'm super excited about it. Dude. Yeah. I want to meet yeah. these people. Yeah. You'd love them. You'd love Carrie, Carrie Hill. If you, if you haven't met her yet, she, no. she's phenomenal. Oh um, yeah. Um, but uh, so we're going to actually, in every, every event, we're going to have a, a, an aspect of it, which is kind of this initiative. Yeah. Or it's a give back um, portion of, of our event. What are we doing at Hazel that's, that's about uh, getting back to connection and getting back to the people? Because Hazel's all about the people. Mm-hmm. Like our whole organization, the culture that we're creating is about the people. Um, and so um, it's super cool because now we give the opportunity for our employees to go out and be charitable. And I was watching some of the videos that he he has from his his group and he's done it with another group down in Florida. Uh-huh. And you should just see the way that the team is just, they're, now they're just in the state of giving and it, it changes the whole culture of this company. Like it, it is I phenomenal, can, phenomenal. I can only imagine what that would have done to any company I'd ever been a part of. Yeah. You know, what if you had a company culture of group giving back? Yeah. So wow. it, yeah, instead of this big, big check that they hand over to a, a nonprofit, um, you know, for the cameras, now the company gets to participate. All the employees get to participate in doing good. It changes everything. And so my, my last company, um, for the love, uh, I, I had a similar, and it changed me forever. It changed me, but every morning I would write a, a letter. It'd be about a paragraph or sorry, three paragraphs because you have to have it a little bit longer. So the walls start to come down with people. Yeah. Um, and then I had a, a person that I connected with. Do you know uh, Tom Ballard? I know Tim. No, not, not, not Tom. Tim. So yeah. different people, but yeah, yeah. Tom Ballard has, he creates these heart rocks, these polished rocks for suicide prevention. Really? And, and so it's just a reminder that you're loved. Yeah, yeah. And you just put it in your pocket. Uh, and so I would, every morning I would write these, these letters and have a heart rock and put it in this clear plastic envelope and just put it in my, my coat pocket. Uh-huh. Um, and I just leave it there and just, just wait until you kind of get that. Just This person needs th- it. This person probably needs this today. And then I just walk up to them and hand them the, the letter and be like, I, 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 I write these letters in the morning and for some reason I just, I just want you to have this today. And then you, you, you're out, you know? But the, the cool thing that happens when you combine that with, so I, every morning I do three, three things of gratitude too mm-hmm. as well. Um, so when you have these three things of gratitude that kind of set your mind in the state of gratitude, and then you're going out and blessing other people's lives, oh man, it's so freaking rad. Like you don't have to accomplish anything for the day and you still feel like you accomplished something. You right. changed someone's life. You know? you know, we were just thinking about this. We had my son's birthday party over yeah. at the jump gym yeah. and uh, it's a group of 12 year old boys. Right. And that comes with every definition that you can imagine comes right. with a group of 12 year old boys. Right. And we're handing out cake and doing the presents and stuff. And uh, we watched as one of these boys, he's actually our next door neighbor, yeah. a little bit younger than my son. Yeah. And he gets his cake. And I didn't know this until after, and Richard told me about it. And he's like, I watched him do the most amazing thing. I'm like, what? He's like, before he ate his cake, he prayed. And my first thought was like, all right, well, bless and make mm-hmm. this cake good for me. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. good luck with that, you right. know? But he's like, no, no, he was praying with gratitude. He just said, thanks God for the cake. I love that. I love, I love that. Yeah. Yes. And that, that stuck with me. I'm yeah. sitting there with my yogurt earlier today. I'm like, did I fall, Did I do as good as that kid next door did? Did I, yeah. did I thank God for the yogurt in my hand? But, but that, that's the crazy. God doesn't require that at all. We do, though. That's the thing. We, we require the gr- good gratitude. Um, and so it, it's not that God is ever sitting there saying, oh, Devin forgot to ask for that. Oh, thank not at for all. Cake. He, God doesn't care. No. But... God just wants us to be happy and, yeah. but the gratitude is for us. And exactly. And, and so when we, when we're sitting, there's so many times I'll be just driving in the car and I'm like, I'm so full of gratitude right now. So much has happened that I just so grateful for. And then, then you say quick, for, thank you so much for everything that's going on right now. Yeah. Even, even the hard things, like the hard things, I mean, the, starting a business and being, being a founder of a startup. That is not easy. No, no, it's not for the faint of heart. No, not at all. Not at all. But, um, but the, the great thing is, is there's so many lessons that you learn in that scarcity mm-hmm. when you don't have things, when, when 
homes are being, um, eviction notices are being sent out, mm -hmm. repossessions of your cars are being sent out. Um, it, it's, and I'm not, a, I'm not suggesting everybody get to that point. Yeah, well, we hope we don't. We, but, we learn the lesson without that expense. But um, it, 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 people that are founders that don't have those experiences that just walk into a company, um, that's, I, I think, where you, you get that aspect of not feeling that they earned it. Mm -hmm. That imposter syndrome when they have this company and they just walked into it. But the cool thing that happens when you live in this moment of scarcity, when you're, you're str struggling and striving to do everything you possibly can to get this company off the ground, it, it, that, that is gone. Yeah. That is gone. And so now you get to sit there in appreciation and gratitude and just show up in, in those feelings instead of, oh, I don't, I don't quite earn this. Like, yeah. How did I, I didn't, I didn't earn this, but, um, and so that was a blessing from God to, to go through those moments of really, really struggling. And all my friends are such amazing, great people that, um, they all have their businesses. And so they, they knew what was going on and they were there to support, but from the sidelines. Yeah. So they, they knew that I had to be, go through that to, to be who I, I, I am now for this company. And so I, I just really have awesome and, and, and really just great friends that allowed me to go through that struggle. It's, it's, um, I love that you use that word allow. It's like parents walking, watching their kids learn right. how to walk. We have to let them fall. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I, I, I won't ever bail anyone out now knowing what I know because there's so many moments I wanted to be bailed out. But if, if I, if I would have been bailed out, then those lessons that I would have learned never would have happened. Never. Do you ever watch that show yeah. alone? No, I have not. I know oh. what you're talking about, though. Okay, so they, they have yeah. a bailout button. And so they get picked up. But they're either in Alaska or there's some scary cold place. Yeah, yeah. And they have a bailout button, say, and now. And then they lose the chance to win the half million dollars yeah. or whatever. And there's this guy on the current season that has, he's there for himself, of course. But he's, he's also thinking about his son, who's severely autistic. Yeah. And he says, the thing that keeps me going is that my autistic son doesn't have a bailout button. No. no. He can't bail out of his autism. And no. so why would I bail out of this? Um, like, that's amazing. Yeah, and so I, I love that. I, I'm on the spectrum, but high, really high functioning. Uh -huh. I, and my daughter, I, I didn't know that I was on the spectrum at all until my my daughter, um, she she was doing things that kind of alerted to us. Okay, we we need to get her her checked. Um, and then when once we started studying all the things that are surrounding being on the spectrum and autism and Asperger's and and all that, um, I'm like. Wait a second. <laughs> so this is very Wait familiar. Seven out of ten of these. <laughs> so I, I yeah. Nope. Yeah. There's all these there's all these tests that you take to to see if you're not, you know if you should go to a a doctor to to be tested yeah and and one after the the other I'm like there's no way and so I probably took about twenty tests like uh, I took so many tests because no there's no way and so I do it again and it's like yeah you should probably go to a doctor and, no kidding yeah and so but but the cool thing is um all these it's not that I'm gonna go and and change anything that that I'm doing now but. I understand why I felt the way I did growing up. Mm -hmm. I understand why I felt so isolated and, and uh, alone and just different. Like everyone saw the word world so differently. Mm -hmm. And now I understood why. It's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Wow. And I could just let it go. It's be like, well, that makes sense. All those, all those um, insecurities of growing up and be like, why can't I just be like anyone else? Why, why can't I be like everyone else and just be this way? Like it's, it's all gone now because it's like, well, that's because this is the way you are. And well, so I've heard so many entrepreneurs yeah. describe exactly what you just said. Right. And I don't know if it's a hallmark of entrepreneurship or at least these there's a Venn diagram of where that kind of brain overlaps right. with an entrepreneur brain. Right. And it, 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 there's the number of lessons that you have to learn, the number of moving parts that right. you have to coordinate, all of these things. It, it's a gift in every aspect that I've seen people take advantage of it. There's a part of your, so going back to talking about um, autism and where they can't opt out. Right. Um, you, you can opt out. And so th that's the blessing too. That's, that's the blessing because you can't opt out. And so you have no choice but to go forward. And so even I would never want to play chicken with me because I, I'm not turning. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm not turning. Like it's just, it's not in my nature. It's not who I am. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that leads to a, a big wreck and this huge mess that you're now, now cleaning up. But that's, that's, I, I don't know if it's an autism thing. I don't know if it's a, a entrepreneur thing, but I think those people that make it, they're the people that don't swerve. 
I think so. You're exactly right. Alex yeah. Ramosi talks about this all the time, especially recently. Yeah. And I was listening to another podcast. Oh, was it? What was her name, babe? That uh, Hara, that podcast I sent over to you. She's kind of a big deal. And I can't believe I just found her. But she talks about, when you find it, let me know. Uh, but she talks about the Halataha. Is that her name? You guys probably don't know who she is. I, I just found out about her. Yeah. Um, and she's an immigrant and uh, started this company. And she has talked about recently how there's this anti-hustle culture, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So people are giving up and they're becoming lazy and what that's doing. How much do you think uh, Corona and that two years of not being active and even our the kids that have, haven't been socialized correctly, mm -hmm. we're dealing with this two years of people living behind masks, mm -hmm. two years of people not having to work. I think being paid not to work, being paid not to work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah $3,000 a month per individual to be right. paid not to work. It blew my mind. Yeah. And, but it's also, there's this two sided coin. It, it caused a great divide of people who now live in that culture and they are missing out. Right. And it also left room for everyone who is persistent enough yeah. to rise. Yeah. And as odd as it sounds, those people yeah. who are willing to be gritty, yeah. it's going to be just a little bit easier yeah. because the washout is bigger. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with that. There's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Based yeah. on my limited years of knowledge on the planet, I'm not like 100 years old. So, you right. know, based on what I'm seeing combined with what Ty Lopez talks about. And AI. And AI, right? It's, just, it's this renaissance, natural just renaissance that's happening right now. Yeah, yeah. Ty Lopez talks about the three waves of industry. Yeah. And he says the first wave was in the 1920s when we had the industrial yeah. you know, revolution. And then there was this wave in the golden years in the 1950s where mm -hmm. corporations and big high rises right. started to go up. This is a wave we're in of the individual now. The individual, the individual influencer. That's never been a phrase before. It's never been a job description before. Mm. It's the influencer, right? That's really interesting. But I, it's what I'm seeing happening too, and so you have the individual, but there is community. People are hungry for community. Um, and so I, I see just the absence of community. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, it's kind of met the, the headway where it's like, we want community. Yeah, the and belonging. And so the, the belonging, it's in our nature. It's, it's humans. Like we are a communal species. Like yeah, that's, we rely on each other. We do. And that's yeah. that's that's how we even exist. If you, if, if you believe in evolution and, and, and people um, depending on others that are the hunters and hunters depending on other people that are the gatherers, mm -hmm. or, um, there's just this level of trust and trust and community that has been lost I, I would say since the industrial revolution yeah so since, since men went off to the factories to work and women had to take the place of the man and bring up these young boys mm -hmm. in masculinity which mm -hmm. they don't totally understand um and men lost that aspect of working with their kids in the fields yeah the, their boys and their yes. daughters in, in the fields um that that's all gone now and i i think so my my family partner and He's just phenomenal. Wes, Wes uh, Christensen. Oh, uh-huh. So he, he's he's getting his PhD in uh, psychology. He has his master's right now. Um, but he he helps guide men um, to understand why they're feeling the way they're feeling in society right now and what's going on and helps them um, recapture really those feelings of being a man, what it means. Yeah. Not this to toxic masculinity. That, this which only lives in the minds of women, I think. In my opinion, maybe not only, but mostly, I, I think it was I, formulated there. Yeah. So I, so I just disagree with that. Just you can hear, and I'll say why. why yeah. I disagree. Push back. Um, so I believe that there's been a lot of men that don't understand masculinity and are working off this this masculinity that that they've been kind of taught is masculinity, and and it's not. And so I, I think. Uh, real masculinity is showing up and being a protector mm -hmm. of showing up and um, and being a supporter and showing up and um, trying to make your community around you better. Um, and I think that's really at the heart of real masculinity and not this, I'm going to lift a million pounds just to show that I'm a man. I'm going to sit in this cold bath for three hours it's just so to crazy. show that I, and it's great. I love, I love ice baths. Yeah. But but there's just this toxic, I, it's not, I hate the toxic, there's just this side of masculinity, which is like, I got to show others that, I, that I'm masculine. It's the facade. It's a facade. Totally. 100%. It's, it's what you put up so you get the approval of others when it's Correct. empty inside. Correct. 
So that when I say toxic masculinity, that was hard to say. Yeah, exists it, only in the minds of women. At first, only is not true. It's the reason I say largely is because it, it's so crazy to watch what has happened over the last decade yeah. of of women who have seen masculinity as a threat, right, and then become the very thing they were threatened by, right, by donning the male suits. You know that your right. double-breasted suit and and all of these things, and then fighting against the men while pretending to be them, and it's it's ripping us apart at the seams. We've seen it in the last two years, yeah. and there's gender confusion and all of these things, yeah. and it's in my mind never been more important to be a feminine woman and to be a masculine man because right. we, like you said, we depend on each other. One hundred percent. So uh, I'm excited for you to meet Carrie Carrie Hill. Uh, we were just talking yesterday about uh, this aspect. So when I had for the Love Box that that company, we, we were we were going and working with companies, and I I wanted my my companies to be women women led, um, and there's a very specific reason for that. But um, the 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 masculine energies and the feminine energies they need to work together to build companies. Um, so where you have a masculine energy which is very focused on revenue mm -hmm. and processes and uh, making sure everything is in in line, there is a very important feminine energy, which is all about connecting people yeah. and um, and making and really kind of not, not only inside the company but outside the company, make creating this connection and and also just the way they, they approach things and um, so many cultures, business cultures are just destroyed because we've lost. The concern of the the, the person, mm -hmm. the, the internal the, and external, internal and external. So the yeah. people that are part of the company, they should be our focus. Yeah, they're your first customers. They're our first customers. Yeah, yeah, your internals. Yeah, yeah. And so, and and once you take care of your 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 employees, then they are able to take care of people outside of the organization. Totally agree. But with um, there there's just amazing talent and abilities that are not being utilized within our our women our feminine communities. Um, I've seen so many women just come out with a, like a beautiful solutions. Um, and, uh, and so it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I think, I think we're kind of in this, this transition, this renaissance where people are starting to realize, um, the, the connection between the masculine and feminine, feminine energies and the, their and necessity, mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't be operating them separately. Uh, so this brings up the other point, well, not the other point, but so we have Hazel, Health and Wellness. Yeah, I wanted to circle back to this because this is yeah. like the star of the show. I wanted to talk yeah. about all this. Yeah, so we have Hazel Health and Wellness, and I, I'm not talking a lot about the, the sandbox yet because Hazel Health and Wellness is, is kind of the, it's the rocket booster. It, it's the thing that everyone is interested in, but we have created this amazing company that's going to take us, you know, really, really high. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole point is, is to launch the sandbox, and the sandbox is a, a culture company. And it's it's actually led by um, uh, Terry Hill uh -huh. and my my good friend uh, um, Wes Wes Christensen, mm -hmm. so that they're working together. These energies are working together, and he's phenomenal too. That's awesome. Um, but we're creating this culture, and so when people ask about, well, how did Hazel get to where it went? It's it's about the culture that we've created inside our company. It's the sandbox. Now, how old is this company? Remind me. It's it's very. Oh, it's young. nine weeks. It's nine weeks old. Nine weeks. And you already have like two events on the calendar. Uh, we're working on our third. Event. On your third. So yeah. you're you're leveraging these stages. And this is where yes. I wanted to dig into yeah. this. Because you and I agree in, yeah. insofar as stages are the number one way to build your business. Absolutely. And, and getting on stages and, and building the community through your stages and having that sense of I belong here. I belong to something. Tell me about why you brought in events so early into the yeah. inception of your business. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I realized right from the start that meeting person to person just wasn't wasn't effective it wasn't as i wasn't i'd say it wasn't as effective um being able to to expand our reach mm. and so having an event where you might have a conversation with one person um versus 50 people just just at the event itself and then another 150 people uh on on a virtual event mm -hmm. um it just allows you to uh, to have that initial conversation that that allows people to participate in that initial conversation. And then we don't do any selling from our event. Um, the only thing that we, we do is we have one call to action at the very last slide. And we, we let 
our, our physicians and uh, clinic owners know that if they have any questions uh, about anything that w we've uh, talked about during the event, they can scan the QR, QR code and uh, we will have a representative reach out to them mm -hmm. and, and talk to them more, more about the, 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 what we're doing with our, our uh, regulations, our policies, procedures uh, to help our physicians be able to uh, not get in trouble with the FDA and stay above board in all things. Mm -hmm. But also they can talk about, or we, we can talk about the, the products that we offer with the regenerative medicine, yeah, which yeah. everybody needs to have. Oh, I believe in that. So yeah. we, we had this clinic that for a while here. Yeah. And one of the things that always stuck out to me was um, when I got my blood work done. Yeah. I was talking to the doctor, which I believe, for those of you listening, like you should get your blood work done twice a year. Right. At least twice a year. Right. I was listening to um, Keaton talk about this on his call Tuesday night. And are you on those calls Tuesday night, the Limitless Society? No, I, I haven't been part of that. Oh, dude. So he just gave the, the health call Tuesday night. It was right. incredible. I was thinking about you the whole time. Yeah. And he said, get your blood work done twice a year. And the doctor that they had on there said, there is no stage three, stage four, anything. And right. You're constantly getting screened. But anyway, should we, I go in, I get my blood tested. And uh, it, it was mostly clear. There was a couple adjustments that she made. But she the thing that she said was, we want to adjust your hormone levels because you you are within the average. You're within the median. Right. But you're not here to be average. Right. You're not here to be within the median. We want you at peak performance. And just the way that she said that yeah. was like, duh. Yeah. That's the way I operate in every other way. Right. My finances and my right. my like bodybuilding and whatever. Yeah. Okay, teach me how to be peak. That was like a bomb that dropped for me. I, I love that you just said that. So um because Last last week, I I reached out to Wes, um, who coaches men on how to step into their masculinity and to to be men, um, and and I've done a lot of work, um, but there is always more work to do. Yeah, and and so I I told Wes Wes I want to be the best version of myself that I can possibly be in six months. Let's let's just do this. Any no stone left unturned. Don't play chicken with me. Yeah. Well, and I told him like that. I my, love my, that. And, and Wes knows this about me. Like, I want my good friends to tell me all the bad things about me. Yeah. Because w what are we changing if they're always just fluffing us up? They're not friends. I, I no. was in a friendship recently that felt that way. It was yeah. love bomb after love bomb right. after love bomb. And uh, there was the occasional unasked feedback. But in, right. in the best friendships, you're spot on is it's the request for feedback is coming from the individual. Correct. Saying, please, I need you to point out my blind spots. Yes. I always use this analogy. When, yeah. I'm, when I'm, let's say I'm in the parking lot and I'm taking my groceries to my car and someone's coming after me with a knife. Yeah. But let's just say that same man is a surgeon and I went to his office and said, please help me. Mm -hmm. If the surgeon sees something in a parking lot and comes after me with a knife, suddenly I'm scared and he's an axe murderer, but maybe he's like, no, you have a tumor. I can see it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The situation will go much better if you go into his office saying, I'm in pain, please help. Yeah. So when we ask for feedback, it has to be us. Has to be us. Yeah. So un, uh, someone that, that's willing to, to reach out with un, unwanted feedback, I mean, meaning if, if you have a person that is constantly just boom, giving, boom. yeah, yeah. And, and there's there's no love behind it. Mm -hmm. And there's no permission. There's I no per per permission say, is a big deal. It's a big, I can yeah. say, can I give you some feedback? Yeah. And if you were to tell yes. me no, I'd be like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I love that. Yeah. You were yeah. going to tell me what it was though. I went off a tangent. Bring me back in. No, we're, we're good. Let's, let's, let's keep on going. <laughs> okay. You said best version of yourself within the next six months. Yeah. Yeah. So, and here's, here's the cool thing. So this is how the universe works, right? And so I was telling Wes, I want to be the best version of myself within six months, not, not just mental, um, mental mindset but um, health, everything, like all those things that I've had excuses for, because I got in that motorcycle accident back in August, um, broke, for you don't know, broke like five, five vertebrae in my back, broke my, my hip, uh, knee was destroyed, traumatic brain injury, um, shoulders were destroyed, like, so I, I don't remember it at all. The, the last thing I remember was telling my wife, I love her, I'm going on a ride. And then I, I guess I, I ran through a light and broadsided a car. On, on my bolt bike. Oh my God. Yeah. So, but here, here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. Because I, I think we, our initial reaction is like, oh my gosh, that that's sucks. a lot of trauma. But here, here's the. I know, you're like, bring me gratitude. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I was siloed at that point in my life. Being an entrepreneur, 
I was uh, doing land acquisition and development, a company where there's so many issues, so many variables that we couldn't account for. It was just, it was, it was a rough time. Um, and so then that hap accident happened. And the first thing I see uh, waking up in, in that hospital bed is my good friend who passed away, um, Roger Jacobson. He was the mm -hmm. very first person I saw there. And then I saw the rest of the community that was there behind Roger. And that lie that I had been telling myself all the time that I was siloed and alone, that oh, the yeah. evidence was right there that that was bullshit. Yeah, you just got punched in the heart. Yeah, so so now I know that the community is all there. Yeah. Now, now my perspective changes, it's like, the world is a lot different than you've been picturing it for the last 44 years or whatever, whatever that was. There are people that love and support you. They, they went and moved furniture around my house so I can move around in my house. Um, we had meals for, for, for forever. They're watching our kids. Like they were there. The community was there. Without my, being asked. My perception was what was wrong. Yeah. Um, so by day three, I mean, I couldn't even sit up in the bed or anything like that. My wife had to help me. Um, at th that time I was pretty muscular still. Um, but, uh, but I, I realized day three that I was not going to spend another moment in that hospital bed. Um, I was going to get out into the world that I had been missing for so long because I created all these walls to protect myself, which didn't protect myself and take me, kept me isolated from everything. Yeah. Um, so I, once I realized that, that I wanted to be out there, uh, it was by day 10 that I had my first meeting where I took my walker and went to a lunch meeting and had my first, uh, first meeting with, uh, people again. And so it, it was Are you still in the hospital at this point. No, no. So I, I got out of the hospital really quick. Yeah. Um, so I think it was by day four or five, even with, with all the things that have yeah, happened. I'm like you still got tubes and vertebrae and no. So I didn't have tubes. Um, I just had, um, I had tasks and other things on me and I, yeah. And that's that's it. So I, I actually wow. recovered really, really fast. I was gonna say this is this is last August, right? It hasn't even last been last August twenty ninth. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at the other motorcycle rider in the room. <laughs> yeah, it's I still miss it. I still no one hundred percent I still miss it, but my wife going through that experience where she so with this accident, um, someone at the the accident scene used my face or whatever to to open the phone and, and call my call my wife and and you're passed out you don't remember that oh no i don't remember any of it yeah so they, they got in touch with my wife and let her know that i was in a, a bad accident and that she should probably get down you know down there and see me and she ended up following the, the phone with the hospital yeah um, yeah the tracker in there yeah but during that whole time she she thought i was dead and so for <laughs> for two hours for for two hours she's planning the rest of our lives without me like where, where am I going to live? You know, I'll live in my parents' house or where are the kids going to school? How are we going to take care of all these things? Like she was living for two hours, just driving her car. And she's like, I don't know how I did it. Like I was just, I just got in this mode. And she's like, now I can, re I realized that I'm really good at this. Like if I'm in this like place where things are not good, I'm, I can actually do really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. So grace under pressure. Yeah. Say. Yeah. So she got to the hospital, um, you know, before I even did. But, uh, and then she's met by a real good friend that happened to be the, the head of the nurses, nurse, all these blessings that happened. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, where she, she was able to finally just like, you know, break down for a second and just like process everything that was going on. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I won't, I won't get on another motorcycle, um, at least on the street. Um, but, uh, just because I know what she went through. Yeah. I asked her two weeks after, uh, cause I'm like, I wasn't there. And so I, I'm like, Ash, what, tell me about what you went through. I, I just want to know what your experience was like. And she just told me everything that she, she went through. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not never getting on a bike again because mm -hmm. out of respect for her and just how much I love her yeah. to put someone through that much trauma and pain. It's never want to do that again. Mm -hmm. If you ever do that to me, so <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. The, okay. So this, I, I want to get back to the Hazel project. Yeah. Because what when we first met, this was so jaw dropping for me. So you you've got this project, you're putting yeah. on events. This is a stage. Tell us about who Hazel is, yeah. what the mission is, and what the purpose is. Yeah, absolutely. So my my good friend Ben Lakey, he, he has a daughter. Uh, she's uh, 11 years old and she has leukemia, um, and um, 
but she shows up in life with just so much excitement and joy and she just loves. And I, I, I created this, I started creating this company and I didn't have a name for it at that point. Um, and then once I, once I started thinking about what she's going through and, um, I'm like, oh, Hazel's the name. Like I, I knew mm-hmm. it at that moment. So I, and I've had several conversations with my, my good friend, Ben Lakey about just the experience of having a daughter with leukemia and the experience that other families have, um, bringing their daughters or, or having their kids go through these processes. And, and Hazel watches, watches the, all these kids that have cancer come in and their patients with her and then they don't make it. Uh, the kids end up not, not, you know, beating, um, it. beating it. And so, uh, he, he told me that 75% of these families, uh, end up in divorce because 75 percent um and so and and it, and it's because of all this emotional energy you know trying to support your kid but then on the other side of it you have this financial burden that that takes place or these procedures that that, that your kids can't have because you don't have the means to give them them and it feels it, wrong it, uh, well it's 100 percent wrong and we're yeah. going after it yeah um so these kids are denied these all these treatments and medicines that if they were where the insurance companies will say it's a last case resort or you have to you have to do all these other procedures, then we'll allow you to try this. It boils my blood so much to hear that, like the, the yeah. corruption of the insurance industry. Oh, it, 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 it's all crap. But... It doesn't cover regenerative. It doesn't cover preventative. It doesn't. Yeah. Well, and then when you think about it, the, the FDA and and the the studies that that are um, conducted through the FDA to get uh, pharmaceutical approval. Um, the pharmacies are the ones that are paying for these expensive, expensive studies. And so the, the FDA is very, very happy to allow them to keep on doing those studies and getting their, their, their stuff pushed through. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the medications that you can't patent and make money on, um, the, the treatments that you can't patent and make money on, um, like biologics, mm-hmm. you can't, you can't patent biologics. Yeah. The stem cell, the stem cells, um, you can't patent the bilk accord and you can't pat, patent. Sorry, it's not possible. Yeah. yeah. You're trying with the agricultural industry. I mean, you know what Monsanto is doing right. with all of their garbage. And then uh, they're able to fine you if they find their genetic material in your plants. Like they're right. trying to patent food, which yeah. is utterly ridiculous. So what, it's only a matter of time before they try and put a stamp on some biology. Well, yeah, they will. They'll figure out. A, so the way that I'm not a attorney, my my. My good friend founding or the founder Chuck, uh, Dr. Chuck Meeker is is our attorney and general counsel, and he helps our our practitioners actually um, navigate this this very interesting and dynamic dynamic yep. medical field. Yep. Um, and our whole point, I'll, I'll talk about Hazel. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what Hazel is is an organization that helps uh, practitioners, doctors, clinicians be able to offer regenerative medicine to to patients. Um, to be able to offer regenerative medicine to the people that need it, we have to go through the FDA and make sure that we are following all regulations, that everything is done in order, or the FDA can come back and say, hey, we did not approve this medicine. We didn't improve any messaging that you, you may have been giving about this medicine. We didn't improve any claims that you make because um, you didn't go through our studies program, which good luck. Yeah. Um, but um, so what we do is we provide the framework for these practitioners, for these clinics, for these doctors to be able to operate in the up and up. So we know the regulations. We know all the things that we have to, to do to, in order for our clinicians to be in the clear. Um, and we give them all the resources with our with our attorneys and every other aspect so they can now talk about regenerative medicine and offer it to their patients without being worried about the FDA oh, knocking on the door and taking their license away. So and then the FDA, let's be honest, like the, they're, they're going to first give a, a slap on the wrist they're, they and say, hey, you need to stop. Mm-hmm. And, and in all reality, the FDA is only going out, is really just going after the people that are the most blatant about it and are making false promises about the, the medications and its capabilities and what it can do. Mm-hmm. And so we're just teaching people to just stick to the facts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we have all the whole legal framework that we've, we've um, built out for them. 
We have red light, green light, and yellow light language. You can say these things. Be careful when you're saying these things. You know, don't ever say these things. Oh, yeah. let me turn that off. Um, and so we give them the the legal framework to be able to offer regenerative medicine because we want to take that that stress away from them. Good. Yeah. Um, so they don't have to worry about the FDA knocking on their door and closing them down. Um, now we've given them the okay to talk about regenerative medicine. And then, then we can tell, give them, so Dr. Paul Winterton is our medical director. We just brought him on. 30-year mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeon, Harvard trained, and is not giving up the knife, but first, and this is how it should be, he is first focusing on helping the body heal itself. Mm -hmm. And then once the once that has been, we, we know that, hey, this, they need this, some support. This is an yeah. injury that you 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 can't. It's not going to go reconnect itself. Yeah, yeah. You need to get in there. And you sew need it back a, up. you need to yeah. sew it back up. But then you can actually inject and and do um, regenerative medicine procedures after you've had the surgery, mm -hmm. which will help those areas not only heal back. I've seen it happen. It's oh, the wildest thing. So so many advancements. So so Dr. Winterton, these events that we we host every month, uh, Dr. Winterton's role is to talk about the advancements that are happening in regenerative medicine. Um, and he, he has his, you know, fingers on, on the pulse of what's going on in the community. And he's just been in there for so long. And so it's really, really fun to hear about everything that's happening. I mean, we're talking about, um, we, we thought baldness was just something we had to deal with. With regenerative medicine, people are actually seeing, uh, not, not they're completely bald, um, but they can even do implants and then regenerative medicine and their hair is growing back. And not only is the hair growing back uh, or thickening and growing back, but it's losing the gray that it has into it. That's crazy. It's, it's really, really remarkable. I have a friend that's going through that right now with um, yeah. hair transplants. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know if he's used regenerative medicine to support the transplants, but I think that's on his docket. And it's been, that's crazy. Yeah, you'll have to talk to him about it. So you can, regenerative medicine, PRP. Yeah, I, I think he's a PRP before. Exosome treatments. Yeah. It's not just stem cells. Like, yeah. there, there are so many different types of uh, regenerative medicines and treatments that you can do. Uh, that allows the body to heal itself, mm -hmm. and versus and versus like pumping all these poisons into to your body to to alleviate the pain or oh, yeah. or, or just to mask what's going on because that's what pharmaceuticals want to do. Like they want to keep you perpetually sick. Exactly. And yep. so it's sick care, not health care. <laughs> right, right. And regenerative medicine is all about giving your body like all these tools to be able to heal itself, mm -hmm. and can and then be healed. You know. You know, perpetually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, it creates this chain reaction in your body where everything just starts kind of re regenerating. When so. you start your podcast, yeah. I think I introduced you to Renee already, right? Yeah. So Renee actually wants to meet next week. She's yeah. so cool. I've been working with her for the past three months or so. And yeah. And she had a son. Get this. I don't know if she told you about this. At 15, her son was nonverbal autistic. Right. Right. And she did all, she was raised in Western medicine. Like she was yeah. a nurse and all of these things. Yeah. And, but she started to ask these same questions. Yeah. Right. And like, is this working? Is this working? It's not working. Yeah. Like food can heal us. Other things can heal us. Sound yeah. waves can heal us. Yeah. And all these things. And so she changed her son's diet completely yeah. to the point where, and this is 30 years ago, but she's uh, pulling in food through the California ports and ordering it from overseas because that's where it's safer and all that. Mm -hmm. Her son right now is in his 30s. And he is taking the stage, public speaking. He mm -hmm. He's a so master cool. electrician. Like, yeah. you would never, and he speaks like five different languages, can wow. read and write Latin and Hebrew yeah. and all of these things. He's absolutely brilliant. And when I wanted you to meet, I just, I can knew something. I just want to put you in the same room and watch what happens because yeah. she's, she's all about um, the same kind of healing and regenerative medicine. Right. But also she does beyond blood work panels for parasites and parasitic infection. And oh, I'd love to talk to her more. She's going to love her. And, and yeah. the, she's been very nervous up until now to talk about this publicly and on stage. Yeah. Because in the 50s, people were getting killed for sharing this. Right. You know, homes were getting raided. Doctors were mysteriously dying before they go testified in front of Congress right. and all of this stuff. But it's, it's becoming more accepted and more mainstream for some reason. I, maybe the FDA just can't stop it, or maybe the enemies of this stuff just can't stop it. Whoever thank, that is. Thank the internet. But, uh, thank you, internet. <laughs> thank you. Now, now we can but, communicate with yeah. each other and say, "Hey, this is wrong." Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm excited for you to to connect with her. Yeah. She's freaking brilliant, and she's now starting to take the stage and talk. Cool. She's like traveling. She tra she came here on Tuesday and did a, a Rife machine session with everybody, and it just I'm so excited 
because this, this is becoming more commonplace and more people are getting helped. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. There, there, it, there is a, we're, we're, I mean, I've said this before, like a renaissance, but we're really kind of in, in a renaissance in multiple different facets of life, um, within the medical community as well. And so you, you have those doctors, those physicians that are FDA doctors, like they, most of the, I mean, let's be honest that the FDA is very, very involved in the education of our practitioners in, in college and through every aspect of their education. And so you, you have this, this group of practitioners that are so bought into the FDA that they follow the protocols to a T and they don't step outside of and look at other possibilities that might be there to actually help your, your patients and fix your patients. It's like, well, what's the protocol say? Well, the protocol says this. Okay, so I'll do that. Yeah. So, and nothing against the doctors. And that's what it's just the culture they've been up in. They think they're doing their best. One hundred percent. Can't fault them for that. One one hundred percent. And they're told this is this is what you're supposed to be. If you're a doctor, being a good doctor, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. Dot 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 mm -hmm. dot. You follow the standard procedure of care. Right, right. And as humans, we've we've become too lazy, and we we become too reliant on other people telling us what to do in not only our own lives, our own health, uh, but but in everything. Um, and I, I think that the sooner people can, can realize what's going on and step away from that and take accountability in their own lives with their own health, their own mindset and stop relying on other people to help make them happier or make them healthier. I, I think that's, I think that's what we're going to see here with, even within the medical community, I think we're going to get more people involved with their own health and stop relying on, um, we, we're always seeing that and, and I'm, Please rely on your doctor. I'm not telling <laughs> Big you not. Asterisk, right? <laughs> I'm not saying to not follow your doctors. But maybe get a second opinion or a but, third but or give, fourth. Yes, take, you know, take ask account, multiple. Take accountability. Yeah. If he tell if your he or she whoever it is says this is what you need to do, question it. Yeah, question it. That's and, an option. Yeah, it's not gospel necessarily. A right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but within the medical community, that's that's what's really cool is this regenerative medicine, what it's able to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we'll we'll start to see um, a lot of changes that are, that are going to happen. We already are. I got to yeah. introduce you to a friend of mine, Christina Kreidel. She used to be my hairstylist, and and then she left the beauty industry because of how toxic it was in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. And now she's so funny. She's like, I consider myself a witch now. I I brew stuff. I, I love make it. Potions and I do. I would love to meet her. Baths. She's so cool. Yeah, I have to introduce you guys. You can find her on Instagram. She's very very yeah. popular there. Um, so tell me about as we wrap up the vision for where you want Hazel to go and what you want it to yeah. do. What's the big big vision? Um, so. It Hazel's amazing and beautiful, um, and I I wanted to to change the world with in in, in medicine, and uh, I want people to be able to take uh, more accountability in, in their lives. Uh, we want to give doctors the ability to offer these uh, alternatives to their their patients, which are being blocked right now by uh, the FDA and other other agencies. Um, but the the whole goal is to really create this amazing, beautiful culture where people get back to humanity. Um, and get it back to the people because that's what's really, really important. Um, and I, I think we've lost, we've lost that a little bit. Uh, and so I, I love Hazel and what we're doing, but more importantly, it's the, the people that are part of Hazel and the culture that we're creating within Hazel that is just going to flow over outside of Hazel and into families' lives and communities' lives. Um, and that's that's really what I'm excited about is is humanity and and people being able to um, learn self love for themselves for the maybe sometimes for the first time for me it was the first time 44 years old never loved myself um, so that's what I want to create within our company is people that can love themselves because when they love themselves they love everyone else yeah and so that's what we're doing can phrase it better myself that's beautiful it, 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 then in the last week and a half maybe a little bit longer you're the third person that has been so family centric with their business yeah that i have run into cynthia zach i just did a podcast with her yesterday yeah she teaches out of miami she said i want to teach families i don't want to separate the parents or the kids in different classes i want them all together scott donnell over at uh dinner table same thing yeah. i want to educate everyone about finances with yeah. the families all together that central family so, unit I, I love that you said that our, our very first 
hire was Will, Captain William. So Captain William has Down syndrome. His his mother was um, she's coming onto our company and she's she's a nurse. Um, so she should be doing procedures with with uh, patients and clients. Uh, and there's so much anxiety in her voice uh, mm -hmm. about coming to this meeting because she doesn't like to leave her her son alone. She's worried about leaving him with other people. They're just they're connected at the, the hip. They're just it's so fun. Such a beautiful relationship. And so when I heard that anxiety in her her voice, I said, um, we are now offering William a, a job. He's going to be our very first employee. So our very first hire was William, Captain William. Um, but I, I let her know he is he needs to be at all the meetings that you're at. And you guys are a team now. So when you guys go out and treat patients, you guys both treat the, the, you know, you treat as a team. Yeah. I, I wanted to take that anxiety away around that she felt around her kid, around her, her son. Yeah. Um, and I wanted her to know that he is welcome it, it, it here. And so it, it's been so cool. He just has this amazing, beautiful energy that he just brings to everything. And he wears this captain hat around and you'll meet him. I want to. Yeah, you'll meet him. Um, but their relationship is just so beautiful. He, she just loves him so much and he just loves her so much. And to hear that anxiety around having him around, um, a, a certain, centered around some, a person that's so important to her that she loves so much, I, I, that's not acceptable. And so if, 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 if business is getting the way of people living and being where they want to be with who they want to be, um, if they feel that they can't have something important as their their child um, that they that they support and they that depends on them there then we're doing something wrong um, and so that that changed right there like with Hazel he's he's our very first employee he's part of her team and so whenever someone gets a treatment from um, from her she gets a, they get a treatment from her and, and Captain William and so he. I told him, um, I told her, cause she's like, well, I need to get scrubs. And said, tell, tell him to find some awesome scrubs. That he some, loves. That's yeah. something that's willing, that he just loves. And I said, I, we don't have any dress codes. So whatever William wants to wear, that, that's, that's authentically him. I, I want people to be authentically themselves in this company. And, and when, when, when they're meeting with other people. And You're so, going to make me cry. Oh my gosh. I, this, this is hitting me so hard because I've spent so much time in companies and cultures where the family was embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it robbed me of years with my kids. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. So even more so, I, I won't name the organization, but we, we were, um, when I had my other company for, for love, we, we did, um, consulting culture consulting within, within companies. And uh, this this company is a very very huge national company. Um, there was a, a woman that that climbed up uh, the the ladder to be a very um, important executive in this company, and uh, and she was battling cancer, breast cancer, and and you you know with women they have to they've in the past have to almost take on this masculinity to be taken seriously mm -hmm. in the business culture. And she was in that place of where this weakness, this moment of just being a human, um, it, it felt to her like she couldn't be a human because the culture that this company created, this is not acceptable. For, for her to go through this battle alone, having breast cancer and not feeling that she can bring her team, the company into what something that important is just, that that needs to be gone. That that needs to be be gone. If people are battling through breast cancer or other things that they're experiencing in their life, we should be able to support each other as mm -hmm. as humans, uh, and not feel that um, being human is a disadvantage to our our careers. Wow, that statement right there, humanity is not a disadvantage to your career. I want that everywhere. Wow. Okay, so how can people get a hold of you? How can they? be a part of your community? How can they be part of what yeah. you're building? So I, I love our, our events are, we don't sell anything. It's just all informational. Um, and so I will give you the, the link to the events that we do monthly. Yeah. And they can tune in and, and see what we're doing. And, um, 
And then at the end of the event, they can scan a QR code if they want to talk to more about um, to our staff more about what we're doing. Uh, then the, then our staff will reach out to them and talk to them at that point. Beautiful. Okay, but we'll throw those. I'll give, yeah, notes. I'll give you the link and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. good. Can do you have a social platform where people can come find you or follow you or? No, this this is what's so fun about. So I even had a, a website that I created in the first days of the the company. And we pulled it because the messaging is so vastly different. From <laughs> just just in nine weeks, he grew. <laughs> in nine weeks, I'm like, oh, we can't, we can't do this anymore. We, we need to take this down. Oh. Um, and so, but we we do have um, a company that's working on on the the messaging and, and building out the website, where the old website just needs to disappear. Yeah, all of us go through that as entrepreneurs. We miss yeah, our... I, I did a great job though. Like, I mean, for for the moment there, when you're the founder, you're doing everything. Oh, yeah. You're wearing the accountant hat, the marketing hat, the graphic design hat, Everything. all of that. Everything. I get it. And it got us to the point where we could hire mm -hmm. people to take care of that stuff. But Good. Yeah. Well, if, if that ever comes to a point where you have an evergreen thing, let me know. I'll update the show notes yeah, yeah. with it and put it in there. But, Perfect. Um, the next Perfect. event, we'll put it on there, and then people can just keep track of you through that and, yeah. and so forth. Devin, thank yeah. you so much. You betcha. For thank you. Today. Thank you for being part of everyone here's live. Thanks, guys. Guys, you're awesome. Guys, this is the... Uh, oh, gosh. I don't. I forget which number we're on on the Marianne Hickman show, but this was one of my favorite episodes. I loved having you here, and we will see you on the next episode. Take care. See you guys. So one of the things I loved about talking to Devin was his level of vulnerability, talking about his accident, everything he went through to heal his mind, heal his body. And I had no idea, but he shared with us on the episode that he was actually on the autistic spectrum. And what a remarkable brain. What a remarkable individual. And what a way to turn this this what some might consider a handicap into a super power in business and a super big heart for loving others. I hope you look into what he's working on because this guy is worth watching. He's only going to grow and bless so many lives. So here's the cool thing. If you are looking to get on stages, I've got 500 plus podcasts that are looking for guests with your expertise and your specialty. In fact, if you want access, here's what you got to do. Go to MarianneHickman.com forward slash database and I will automate the delivery right to you. We'll see you in the next show.